the July 8th meeting of the East Penn School Board is hereby called to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First order of business is requested to address the board. I have none. Uh, so moving on to approval of minutes. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Next is an update on the uh, high school turf field project. I'd like to welcome Jamie Lynch. He's back with us. He is the principal and senior project manager with Dewey Engineering. You might recall Jamie provided us with a general scope of work as well as the timeline for the turf field replacement project. And he was here with us in February of 2019 to provide us with that overview. And we're um, thrilled to have us, him joining us again this evening with a status update for our turf field project. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for being thrilled. Yeah. Hope everybody had a good fourth. Thanks for that introduction. And hopefully I'll be able to work this MacBook, this uh, Microsoft guy. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, yes, good evening. Um, I am Jamie Lynch with Dewey Engineering. We've been working on uh, the first uh, component of East Penn's turf project, which uh, I called a, a feasibility study. So without further ado, um, we conducted several meetings with, uh, with staff to arrive at uh, what we think is a proposed scheme for the new turf project inside the stadium. Uh, you may recall that uh, Rick Babiak is our athletic designer and he loves to put lots and lots of schemes together because there really are lots of variations for a turf uh, field project. <clears throat> and I have a pointer. Um, so without going all of, through all of those schemes, you'll recognize uh, this image of the existing track and the field and the decision of the team was to relocate the track venues for high jump long jump and pole vault inside new d's of the stadium field and relocate throwing events out of the field up to the upper softball field so that's a short description of what the arrangement would be there'd be multiple lines on the turf field for obviously football, but also soccer uh, and lacrosse. There's lots of different variations in which those lines can be applied. Uh, they can be put in permanently, which we're advocating for, or they can be painted on later, which is always a little bit of a maintenance headache. Uh, logo at the center of the field, uh, letters in the end zones. Um, these are all variations. This is, happens to be the variation that I think the entire team uh, likes. The letters in the end zone can be bid as bid alternates, so there's still plenty of flexibility come bid time, how we actually price them and bid them, but this was the general consensus. We also met with uh, Lehigh Valley Health Network to get their idea on what they would like to see on the field. Fortunately, we're working with, uh, uh, with them on another project at Northwestern Lehigh. And the heavy lift had really been done as to how it works. They're doing kind of the same project up there. And for this field, they're asking for their white logo to be on the D of the track and their little fan logo without lettering to be on the field itself. So that's what it would look like. Some minor things here. Um, <clears throat> we're recoding the track surface. Obviously, there'll be new coding over the 2D areas. Uh, we have uh, two ways to run the uh, high, or excuse me, the long jump and the triple jump. The high jump would be on the northern end of the field. New goalposts would be included. Um, We've got a new channel drain that would go on either side of the field in order to collect drainage from the field and also from the under drain system that'd be tied into the stormwater system. So I can come back to this at the Q&A, but let me keep going. Uh, just a larger view of the field in this image. 
And then the idea was to relocate our throwing events up to the softball field at the upper field. Essentially, this is just area that's required for the throwing events. We would leave the softball backstop there as a safety measure. And for discus, we would put the circle up there on the softball field and seed the infield. So that would put all of the throwing events up on the upper field. <clears throat> so just taking a look at schedule for a second, uh, in the upper section of this schedule is what we've done to date. Uh, we've, we've performed concept development with uh, the staff, also with uh, Lehigh Valley Health Network. Uh, you saw me earlier in the year give a little update on what we were doing. Uh, we've had our several design team meetings with the AD and, and staff, and we've completed the geotechnical investigation and the topographic survey, and I'll speak to those in just a minute. <clears throat> we've also completed a preliminary municipal meeting with Emmaus Borough. And the good news there is that uh, the borough is going to forego the land development process for this project. So we'll submit for a building and grading permit only, but we won't have to go through a lengthy permitting process. So uh, they were very cooperative and uh, very excited about the project as well. So from here, in short summary, after reporting tonight, we'd like to proceed with track design and stormwater calcs. And the reason for that is that we have a lengthy permitting process with the conservation district to go through. It usually takes four to six months. A little bit of uh, county planning, and uh, we want to go back to Lehigh Valley Health Network for our final review and approval with them, and of course, a, uh, an update with you before we go to bid. <clears throat> and then the overall construction timeline would hopefully be a project advertising and bidding uh, shortly after the beginning of the year. The reason for that is that there are lots and lots of turf projects. If you've uh, read what other districts are doing, not only are new turf projects going in, but those that have uh, gone past 10 to 12 years are being replaced. This business is booming and there are going to be a lot of projects again next summer. There's a lot this summer, there'll be a lot next summer. The idea is for us to get first in line. Um, once bids are approved, we'd have a procurement process and as soon as I can get on the field at the end of track season next spring, we could start with construction. The turf and the uh, track coating could both be done before the first uh, home football game. We've worked with Becky already on what that date is. Um, and it'll be in and finished in time for a home victory over Parkland. At, let's see. So just a little bit of detailed information for you on what we've done to date. Uh, topographic and feature survey is complete as well as the geotechnical investigation. The feature survey basically gives us the lay of the land, identifies for us the elevation of existing stormwater that's out on the field, um, and all of the other fields and grading issues associated with performing work like this. The geotechnical investigation was necessary in order to confirm everything that was happening underground with respect to soils, water, rock quality of soils, etc. And uh, nothing but good news came out of that investigation. Uh, first, we have roughly 12 inches of topsoil on the field. That's always interesting for us to know because we have to get rid of it when we do the field, and it's always a marketable product. So if there's good topsoil, uh, either, there, first of all, the district or the municipality lots of times wants to have first right of refusal on that. So I always like to say if you need topsoil, uh, we're going to have some to spare. Next, it becomes a marketable product for the contractor. So that's reflected in his bid price when he sees that there's good topsoil on the job. Uh, next, utilities were relatively deep, so we don't have to worry about them. In the lower right picture here, it's hard to see with the lights on, there actually is an existing under drain system on that field that will uh, that is currently defunct and uh, definitely will be taken out as a part of this project. Uh, no rock was encountered in test pits that went down as deep as 10 feet. Um, so that was exciting to see because that has to do with how we store stormwater on the project. The soil appears to be well graded, meaning there's soil mixed with stone, meaning when I compact it, I won't have any soft soils, hopefully. Um, as we go, there's good infiltration, which is good for the stormwater calculations. Um, and so as a result of the geotechnical investigation, the biggest uh, thing that comes out of it is the fact that we can store our stormwater underneath the field in a stone bed. 
and I can do that instead of having to spray irrigate somewhere else on the field. Uh, spray irrigation would probably be tough because real estate's at a premium here and we don't want to be spraying areas of the field late at night. Um, it's just kind of a hassle and there's a pump system as well. So that was the big win that came out of the geotechnical investigation. The only utility that we have to deal with, and I'll speak to this also in, the mo in a moment, is the power for the lights that's on the, that are on the visitor side runs 8.6 feet from the 50 yard line. So there's conduit that runs underneath the field, and I'll speak to the lights in a moment. Lighting was not a part of the project here, but I think we're going to have to do some things to, to uh, make sure that when lights are replaced on the field at some point in the future, we do a good deed now and don't have to worry about the turf. The geotechnical investigation was important, as I mentioned, because of the stormwater. And we'll have a large impoundment that probably runs from about 30 yard line to 30 yard line, might be about three feet thick, and it's simply stone. And that's how we take care of our volume and rate control for water. The, uh, the field, as uh, odd as it may sound, is considered to be impervious pavement by the county conservation district which means basically I can't let stormwater run off the site in any greater quantity than it does now and at any at greater rate. So I have to put it in a, in a bucket, if you will, and let it go out slowly. And that's what the impoundment under the field does. The other thing is we need to know that we have good soils because as you see in the picture here, this is actually Pocono Mountain East Stadium. When we remove all the topsoil from the field, it's generally wide open. So it's subject to impacts from the weather. When I know that I have good soils on the site, it helps me put my bid documents together, it helps me tell the contractor what he can anticipate when he opens up that field helps me also to enforce the fact that there are good soils and that if he lets rain sit on that field for too long it's his job to fix the soils so that we can put the field down a uh, couple of pictures over here on the right side what's happening here up at uh, Pocono a couple of years ago once we've cut all the, the topsoil out and put the field to grade there's two layers of stone that go down before the turf goes down one is a regular uh, grading layer, and then there's eight inches of a special drainage stone that allows all the rainwater to penetrate not only the field, but the layer of stone and land on diagonal under drains that take the water off of the field. So the geotechnical information is really important to us to understand exactly how we need to design this system. I knew you wouldn't be able to read it if I put it up on the screen as far as the budget goes. Believe me, that wasn't intentional. Mm -hmm. um, I can read it from here, and I think you all have copies at your desk. Okay. Um, so with respect to the budget, the overall total field construction cost, including soft cost contingencies and design fees is the bottom figure, just over $1.5 million. And that's comprised of the synthetic field surface, the site work that's required, the additional features like new goal posts, all the corner markings, the turf itself, all of the work on the uh, throwing venues, uh, some minor work in order to extend the water surface that's already there under the field and do everything that's necessary to complete the field as you saw it on the images that are there. The second piece of the budget that takes a grand total up to just over 1.9 million, or you would say just under 2 million, are two other components. One is the synthetic track resurfacing. So the, the synthetic track gets resurfaced really only once in its lifetime before that surface is stripped off completely and redone. This would be that one recoating. So that's estimated at roughly $290,000. The other is really a decision uh, for the board to consider with respect to replacing the scoreboard and its foundations. Uh, we've taken a look at the scoreboard. There have been suggestions of making something that's a little larger, a little brighter, a little easier to see. It's uh, a scoreboard that's been there for some time, and you can see the cost for the foundations, the electrical, the structural, and the scoreboard itself is roughly $145,000. And you say, where did we come up with that number? 
Um, this is the design of a scoreboard that uh, has been provided by a scoreboard manufacturer that uh, works on the Pennsylvania State contract. Uh, essentially, it's a little larger and taller than the scoreboard that exists. This particular design has available sponsor panels, has all of the prerequisite um, numbers and uh, signage necessary for games. The option exists to have an LED banner. That's where you see the American flag here. Um, but due to the size of this scoreboard, new foundations, structural steel, protective netting would all be required. Uh, we'd be using the existing stadium sound system. So there's no sound associated with this uh, scoreboard. And obviously, we just have to repower the scoreboard, which we could do from the uh, existing maintenance garage. So that's really where we are with scoreboard. Um, it's something for the district to consider. I don't need a, a decision and a, and a go tonight. Um, what we're hoping for is to continue with the field itself and uh, proceed with this as you see fit. I mentioned stadium lighting. <clears throat> lighting was not a part of uh, the charge here, but we always have to consider it with respect to what future impacts may come down the road as uh, a result of changing lights in the, in the future. And really the only impact that we have right now is the dotted yellow line that you see on the slide here is where the underground power goes for each of the existing uh, light standards. And as I mentioned, it crosses the field right, right above the 50 yard line. So assuming that the lights would one day be replaced and be repowered at one point, it'd be prudent to extend at least new conduit uh, across the field now so that that could be expedited when the time comes. And that's really just a matter of laying a couple of four inch conduits uh, under the field now. So it's relatively straightforward. That's what we would uh, advocate at least for now. Uh, we learned after visiting the borough that there's been uh, quite a history behind stadium lights over time. Um, there are height requirements for the poles that the lights sit on. And there's been uh, a couple of different processes that some of you are probably familiar with as far as getting variances from Emmaus in order to, in order to install the light standards. Um, of course, you're probably also familiar with the fact that Memorial Field sits slightly higher than the stadium field. And so the height requirement is different depending on which field that you're on. New stadium lights, if they were to be contemplated, the, the typical, the standard detail, just for your information, is four poles, each of which is 80 feet tall. They're all being done with LED lights uh, these days. Um, typically, the cost, just for your information again, uh, of buying, buying the poles off a state contract is usually about $250,000 plus the cost of installation. And of course, other installation methods, number of poles can be put together. The more poles, the cost goes up a little bit. Uh, commonly, security cameras are included on the light poles um, in this day and age. So we're seeing cameras around stadiums wherever we go now. Um, and then one interesting thing that I learned on your particular light poles is that uh, you've got lead-based paint on your light, existing light poles. So at some point, uh, whether they're reused or taken down, there's going to be an issue with respect to how lead is handled uh, on those poles. Um, again, I'm not advocating for doing anything with the light poles now other than doing a little bit of proactive step to put some conduits under the field for when that happens in the future. So next steps, with your approval, we would commence design on the field uh, and D areas itself and work to submit to the Lehigh County Conservation District for the NPS permit. That review permit uh, period, excuse me, is roughly four to six months. We'll continue to work with the borough and its engineer to complete necessary reviews for construction permits. Uh, as mentioned, I suggest that we try to get this uh, project out to bid as quickly as possible right after the beginning of the year, if not sooner. That way you can get in the turf production schedule. But more importantly, you're getting the better contractors who are looking to fill their schedule earlier uh, in the year. So that's the reason to get out uh, first. 
I don't see any reason that uh, construction would not begin as soon as track season is uh, complete and be finished uh, in time for the first home football game. We've worked uh, many times on fields where the turf went down and we made an arrangement for the track coating to go down almost at the same time. So um, that that's certainly a detail that we can iron out as we get there for the uh, track surface to go down later is also okay either way would uh, would work so with that I'd love to entertain any questions that you have any questions for mr. Lynch mr. Ballard yeah first of all did you run into anything in the uh, run-up to this <coughs> presentation that increased the costs of the uh, project beyond what we've been talking about earlier with the uh, Lehigh Valley Hospital no sir I don't think I found anything that was uh, a surprise or something that I need to bring to your attention that is going to dramatically increase the cost over what I had anticipated when we started okay. second thing is when do you actually need us to tell you to go ahead with this uh, I'm not sure we'd have to consult the solicitor as to whether or not we need a motion on something like that uh, if so, I don't. It wasn't advertised for this meeting, so that's where my question comes. We're we're under contract to perform the design for the school district, uh, so I believe, unless the solicitor tells me otherwise, that we have the authority to go ahead. But what we had identified is that we would do the first part of our contract, which was feasibility, come back to you, report, and get basically a thumbs up to proceed. So if that sounds accurate, um, that's what we'd be looking for tonight. Okay, those are my questions. Ms. Bowman? Um, I'll move up closer to my microphone. Um, I'm, I just have a, a few questions to refresh my memory because um, this has uh, been a long time since we originally voted on this. Can you remind me what your original bid for this was? Have the costs stayed the same or have they gone up? Um, as far as our bid, we're the consulting engineer, so our contract is exactly what it was when we were author authorized. So the cost for the project for the construction, I don't believe has has changed in any way since I've been on board. And, and is this what the estimate was? The estimate yeah, is this the is this within the what the original was? What yeah. I, we've been working toward a goal for the field itself of 1.5 million. If I understand it correctly, that's the commitment uh, that Lehigh Valley Health Network has made. And so the scoreboard and the track coding would be above and beyond that that's amount. That's above. And then is it my memory correct that part of the deal with LVHN is that we do need to replace the scoreboard so they can put advertising on it? Is that correct? What? Can we to address? I don't. The, the contract with LVN, LVHN is um, bifurcated into two pieces, one which is specifically designated for the field and another piece which is speci specifically designated for a scoreboard. Okay. So the 1.5... Is that I'm I just it's been too the long number since is actually 1.2 million 1.2 is for the field and then there's another contract that's for the scoreboard for it's a couple hundred thousand more or something there's not 150,000 in the LBHN right. contract yeah okay okay so we have to take a certain amount of money out of um, capital is the right capital, mm -hmm. sir? Yes. Um, <laughs> that we were not expecting, or were we expecting? Th that's, I guess, that's what I'm leading up to. Is uh, I, I thought that the LVHN contract was going to cover the cost of this project, but it sounds like it's not. And um, it, is that understanding correct? That is correct. So we we knew that the LVHN contract wouldn't cover the cost of the engineering services. We knew that okay. we would have to uh, okay. assume those. In addition, we knew that we would have. To, we had already planned on uh, resurfacing the track in our long-range plan, so we knew that that cost would be okay. in addition. But the field and the um, scoreboard were it's okay. clearly designated to the LVHN contract. Okay, that makes sense, I think. So this is actually split up in a different way than the way original way that we voted on it, but the money all sorts out about the same, I guess. It's, no? it's pretty close. <laughs> actually, if I may be able to help you. Let me just get... No. <laughs> no, I mean, in terms of the way it's laid out. Um, so if you look at the um, field construction yes. total, 
if you break that up into two pieces, one being the um, design, which is 115,000, and then the remainder being the turf field. Okay. Okay. So that's how you could look at that. Okay. So that would be those two components. And then the on the next slide, you can compare the scoreboard, and then you could compare the track. So if you wanted to see the four components that we had discussed previously, that's how you could come up with those. That makes sense. Okay, I'll, I'll have to do a little math after after sure. this. Um, it just the numbers all seem different from what I remember voting on and what I remember agreeing to. And um, uh, perhaps after this meeting, I'll try to do a comparison of them. I, it sounds like nothing increased. We we didn't encounter anything to increase costs. So it's I guess a little confusing to me as a board member that now we're taking money out of capital reserve that I didn't originally remember voting for. But I'll, I'll allow somebody else to. Try I'm in here and and I can I think I know okay. <laughs> so I can address that only because I think I know where where Mr. Champagne is going to go um and and you're you are correct the the amount from LVHN was 1.2 million so that's the amount that okay. had noted in the long range plan as well as the 115,000 which you can clearly see that amount on the on the budget that was presented this evening and then we had budgeted 200,000 for the track okay which was based on a quote that we had received um, directly um, for that work now it was only a quote it wasn't uh, it wasn't it was a estimate not a quote it was an estimate let me be clear about that and then the scoreboard was 150,000 and you can compare that to the number that's here and um, I guess in in terms of it being more, the bottom line is on bid day it has to come in at 1.2 million. Mm -hmm. um, and so Mr. Lynch talked about um, you know doing a number of bid alternates so that we could compare or or understand what the costs are. For instance, the end zone lettering would be a bid alternate. Okay. Now that's included in this estimate, but at the on bid day, if we can't afford it, we can't do it because we only okay. have so much money to work with for this project. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense mm -hmm. okay. I'll, I, I'll relieve or relinquish sure. the floor. <laughs> it is. Okay. Mr. Champagne yeah that, I guess when I when I did the math I mean the original proposal was 1.35 million what we budgeted in the long-range plan including the engineering is 1.315 million this project comes in at 1.52 million so we have to take a hundred and seventy odd thousand okay. for out of other projects in our capital plan to afford this and that's what I'm somewhat troubled with because I don't know what what's higher in priority this or replacing the roof doing paving doing classrooms whatever the budget for the scoreboard is about what we budgeted in the long-range plan it's you know they have 145 we had 150 the resurfacing of the track is 90,000 more than what we have in the long-range plan so we have to again figure out where that money's coming from so unless the bids come in substantially lower yes we have to take more money out of capital reserve at least based on my calculation from other pockets of money to come in with what we have in the long-range plan so I don't know where those numbers are going to come from until we see the bids, but there is a gap right now. And I guess the other question I have is, you know, with we got to do conduit replacement and other things like that. I don't know what that cost. It shouldn't be that great, but that's another adder that we're going to have to put into to this whole budget to tie the numbers out. And then the last thing I don't know that we have discussed, but you know, everything I've read is that there's no shock pad for this field, which in addition is there for safety purposes as well as field longevity. And I don't know what that costs on top of what's in here. So if we have to have a shock pad, if that's prudent, that's an additional cost that we have to account for in the total. So there's, to me, you know, this is a preliminary budget, but unless the bids come in substantially lower, we've got a gap. And so we're going to have to decide how we allocate capital reserve, or we're going to have to cut costs someplace else mm -hmm. if we don't want to take money away from buildings or other mm -hmm. priorities in the plan. So that's kind of the okay. analysis I did. 
Thank you. I, I think that's accurate based on what folks have told me. And forgive me because because I'm the troublemaker here um, because I'm not I'm giving you a budget and not the bids. So for instance, a hundred and thirty nine thousand dollars is included as contingency. Okay. Now, everyone usually says, "Well, oh, you have a contingency. Well, that just gets spent." Um, we don't we don't think that way. Um, I would like to bring this thing in, and we have a history of bringing it in um, very satisfactorily. To use a portion of that one thirty nine for conduits, which is hardly a drop of that. It's very inexpensive. We could do that. Um, so I, I've been the one who's kicked up the cost on the track coding, just because last summer was a tough year for the folks who are installing tracks. I have to I have to resolve that in some way. So what do I do to try to help? Is for the first thing is be the first one on the street, provide our typical clear and concise documents. I'd love to see the savings on bid day. I'm very happy to be your second or third lowest bidder with what I'm showing you tonight. Okay. So I want it to come in. I want it to come in lower. And my charge has been clear that if there's anything that is here that raises the cost to bring it to your attention. Uh, the scoreboard is one area where there is some uh, play, if you will. The LED banner will be a lot of fun with Emmaus Borough uh, because LED flashing uh, light banners are strictly prohibited and they will require a variance. That LED banner with the American flag that I showed on the scoreboard is a line item in the cost estimate of about $30,000. If that went away, you'd have it. But we'd love to have a, a banner. So I think it's a two-step process to understand what the bids actually look like. You would write the PO, for instance, if you bought the, if you bought the scoreboard on state contract after you received the bids. There's plenty of time to still get the scoreboard. So that's how we do the, you know, the, the strategy mm -hmm. to figure out what can you afford and exactly when. Thank you. Shock pad. We didn't talk about a shock pad. That's right. And uh, fortunately, I was with another district that was talking about a shock pad today. You didn't think, you didn't think I'd come with handouts. Hmm. Shock pads, what uh, what used to be a conversation of what the infill material was in a synthetic field has become whether I should put a shock pad or what's called an E-layer underneath a field. And... Um, where does this where does this come from? Well, you know from Memorial Field that you're doing annual GMAX testing on your field, and for uh, the, the interest of brevity, we're checking to see what the GMAX value is because that's an indication of how hard or how soft, if you will, that the field is. On a synthetic field, you're trying to mimic the best natural turf field that's out there, and the the G max rating on an excellent natural turf field is somewhere between 90 and 115. The lower the G max number, the softer the field is, or the more cushiony the field is. When a new synthetic turf field goes in, the typical G max for a well designed uh, synthetic field is somewhere right around 120 or so. The Synthetic Turf Institute requires that it never go above 169, and that's a new number. It used to be 200, it used to be very high. In the grand scheme of things, we've had synthetic turf fields installed for years, either designed by us or by others in the Lehigh Valley. And with well-maintained fields, you really don't see a G-Max that surpasses about 120 or 130, even through its life. Um, I don't know what the, the numbers were for Memorial Field before it was replaced, but the other old field in the valley was BASD Stadium, and they were rarely above 130 before the field uh, was replaced. There are very few shock pads installed uh, in the Lehigh Valley. If there's one, it might even be an E-layer at Bernie Crum, but most of the fields don't. One of the first ones to be installed will be Easton at Cottingham Stadium uh, later this year. 
And here's the trick. On a short field, like a field hockey field, where the length of the blade is two inches or in sometimes less, you have less infill. And we rely on the infill to give us the G max number. And the more play there is on the field, the more splash there is on the field, the more infill goes home in the shoes of the athletes and gets spilled over when there's play on the field. The longer the blade, the more infill there is. On a football field, typically the blade length wants to be two and a half inches versus two inches or something less and therefore it contains the most infill. Your field at Memorial, for instance, is made by Field Turf, and they make their name on the fact that they have the most infill per square yard in the industry. The Field Turf field is something on the order of nine pounds of infill per, per square yard, and their GMAX numbers reflect the fact that they have the most infill. And at two and a half inches, Field Turf, for example, does not recommend adding a shock pad because they believe it's a belt and suspenders situation. There's also some issues where if you add the shock pad on a thinner field to get that low, low G max number, that a field can be too soft. Hard to believe, right? But there's research out of Penn State um, that identifies the fact that on softer fields, there are more injuries to athletes' lower extremities. And so we can go back and forth with this argument. Um, shock pads are very useful on alternative fill materials. Believe it or not, um, coconut shells are ground up and used for infill, and they're extremely light, and they tend to float away. And so on those fields, I don't know where they're installed, with the light infill, a recommendation is made to put a shock pad underneath. So I can go, we can go back and forth and argue one way or the other. Undoubtedly, if a shock pad goes in, you'll have lower G max numbers. Field turf, for instance, will come and say, I don't need to install my two and a half inch field. I can put a two inch field in, which wears more over time than two and a half, because there's obviously less material. So it's a decision that you would have to make uh, that says, hey, you know, I'll add the shock pad, but the difference in the G-Max is probably marginal. Now, the folks who make the shock pad have an interesting take on this, and they're using new testing, not G-Max. They're using HIC testing, uh, head injury conditions, I think it is. And there, that's specifically aimed at preventing concussions on fields. And they've identified, for instance, one group that uses the HIC testing is rugby. So rugby, unlike football, very little head protection when you go down on the field. And there is some thought that HIC testing would be used in the future, but there's really no movement in Pennsylvania to move toward HIC testing. So we go, we go back and forth on what's the appropriate thing to do. What are we doing with our helmets on football players these days? Over, almost over analyzing what they need to be in order to keep the athletes safe. The next question that the industry brings up is where do the head injuries actually occur? Where do they happen in soccer, right? from heading the ball and from head-to-head -head collisions while heading the ball, not from impacting the turf. The same could be said with field hockey and lacrosse. Football, a little bit different, but they have a little bit more padding. And so this is how the industry goes back and forth and tries to justify whether it's needed or not. The short story is, in taking a look at GMAX testing for fields that have been installed for a period of time, they're still very easily able to maintain an adequate GMAX testing below that one 30 mark, which is 30 points, if you will, below the 160 mark recommended by the Synthetic Turf Council. But a shock pad, you, you asked about cost, by the way, of shock pad. For a field of this size, we're probably looking at about $140,000 for that to go in. So that, that's a decision that could be made. Could it be a bid alternate? It, it could be a bid alternate. You would see what that is on bid day. Um, here in East Penn, the fact that we would put one at the football field and not have one at Memorial Field is something to consider. 
Um, obviously football's on one field and other sports are, are on the other field, so that might weigh in. But that that's where I can take you as far as shock pads go. I don't I don't know that it's widely accepted that they're mandatory, but on a football field with a two and a half inch blade and maximizing the infill, you can keep the field safe. Well, do you know why Easton decided to go forward with the shock pads then or did I'm sure that we had the exact same conversation uh, with them. I think that is a multi-sport uh, stadium in Cottingham. I can certainly find out how they made that decision and get back to you. That would be helpful, I think. Absolutely. Um, the decision was just made at Whitehall not to install. Okay. Um, and again, I, I talked to the project manager actually uh, of that project, and and it was the same. It was the same conversation. So it's a it's a go no go type thing. Uh, Mr. Smith. So I had a couple things. Um, first was a was a concern from the financial standpoint, but I think Mr. Champagne laid it out very very well. So I don't want to um, uh, jump on that. As I, I fully echo his comments. Um, Especially because from, it seems, sounds like from an engineering standpoint, there's a lot of good news. Um, things that aren't there under the soil that we we're worried about. So I was fully expecting to see that because that when that wasn't there, it would be reflected in the cost. But um, be that as it may, my, my remaining concerns um, are mostly design related. Um, with the you, you talked about the LED banner being a concern um, with the borough uh, and variances. Is that scoreboard that four foot section? Is that customizable to be able to take that section out entirely and just have the scoreboard with the Emmaus logo on top and then the LVHN? banner on the bottom yeah here here it is this middle section yeah can we just take that out could be taken out it can be turned into sponsor panels you know they, they have all types of variations there if the if the banner was to go so here and here's my concern one would be the the, the borough standpoint um I, I i don't know if that's a huge headache to, to to work with that um if i was a neighbor of the stadium that might be an issue for me um but from my seat where i'm at and i'm looking at that that design, and this is going to lead into my second point about the field itself. The, if, if I'm looking at that, LVHN has a greater presence on that sign than MAS does, and that's a concern for me. Um, and that leads into my follow-up concern. Um, back when we had this conversation a few months ago, um, I spoke about the, and, and maybe it seems like a, a, a small thing, but I spoke about the importance of keeping the field of play sacrosanct and, and, and trying uh, as best we could to keep um, the commercialism of our players off of the interior of the boundary lines. And at that point, I was told that the logos would be confined to the Ds, which they are, um, and that there could be a logo on the field, but it would be outside of those boundary lines. And I'm looking at the field, or the design earlier, and it looks like their fan logo is between the 20 and 25 on, on each side of the field. So, you know, I, and I know that we've already kind of... Um, decided to go forward with a design standpoint so there's not really a whole lot um, that we can do but I did want to I did want to put um, my thoughts out there that um, I was a little bit disappointed to see that there that those logos were on the field itself Thanks. Uh, the um, scoreboard design is concept only came from Nevco uh, the sponsor panels could be anything or nothing at all so that's totally within your control to change I apologize it's not necessarily proposed that all three of the panels would be the High Valley uh, hospital in nature whether it's a local business um, or, or something else you know or something that promotes the school district is absolutely in in line uh, with respect to the logos on the field you know same thing if we need to go back to lehigh valley health network and say that the board would prefer to see something something else something different um, those logos can all be itemized as part of the bid and you can make that decision right up until right up until bid day so 
if, if you want to get together and, and give us direction on what you'd prefer to see, by all means, you have that opportunity over the next several months. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Jankowski? Um, not to rehash the, the cost, but just, just in order so I can contextualize this and, and utilize this for, for future discussion, the, uh, the construction subtotal, is this based off of like the, a premium product with the upgrades? I mean, what are these costs based on? Is it is it a mid, middle of the road? Is it just so we have a better understanding? So um, it is not, uh, how shall I say, NFL quality product. The products that you see in the Lehigh Valley now are actually made and manufactured and are in various uh, stadiums. What we're looking for is something that will give you the longevity that, that uh, Memorial Field gave you. That was a field turf product and they have some variations. Typically, we prefer to put the bid together and compete comparable products so that on bid day, you can see a product and its price and make a decision there. Uh, we are certainly not at Cadillac or Audi or you know name your favorite car that is a as a premium. We're certainly not at a uh, let's just get a turf field in there and we'll take our chances. You know we we have good experience with field turf, with Shaw, with AstroTurf, with Sprint Turf, and we'll bid comparable products that will give you the life that you need. We can also do something uh, in a bid alternate that extends the warranty of the field. Typically, these fields are eight years. We can bid the warranty extension to 10 years. That's about the max that they do. You can go to 12, but then they really stretch it. And you can find out what the cost would be to go to 10 years. Again, you're just trying to get the most for your money out of each of the manufacturers. And knowing that you have field turf here already, I know that they want to remain um, in good graces. And so we, we play to that strategy. And, and what's the scope of what we're looking to do in comparison to what Northwestern or Pocono Mountain are doing, just from a comparison standpoint of pricing, this get a better understanding of what's out there. Sure. So um, I did Pocono Mountain, and we did the stadium at East, and we also did uh, their new turf, turf field at West. And at East, we added all of the track venues as standalone venue without doing the D's, and we did not. Um, recoat the track. It had recently been been done, and the turf itself, with all of the track venues, came in in 2017 at just under a million dollars. So basically, what we're seeing is Pocono Mountain East with inflation to this number. We're not doing anything extravagant. We're doing far less than they're doing at Northwestern Lehigh. They're, they're obviously doing the track. They also have uh, 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 dugout work and all kinds of other work that they're doing, stormwater work related to it. Your stormwater is here. It's in, in place. We're doing the basin that's underneath. Um, this, in my opinion, is really bare minimum of what we'd be doing in order to give you a fantastic uh, venue. Uh, there's not a whole lot of bells and whistles here. We're not putting up new fence around the, the track, for instance. We're not doing asphalt repairs anywhere else. Everything, all the work that we're doing is really directly inside the track here. So I would say that it's modest. And is the track coding something that's necessary at this time? And do we receive a cost benefit from doing it at the same time as the as the turf field from a um, from a work labor standpoint or is it something that I mean as a track reaches this coding reaches useful life or well you guys have good questions um, the answer to that is that the track coding is done by a different company than who does the turf so they're both subcontracted items the benefit of doing it at the same time is really a scheduling benefit for the school district that we don't need to figure out another time in order to come in and interrupt what interrupt what happens in the stadium in order to coat simply coat the track if you're saving anything if you did the two projects separately there's something of general conditions and overhead and such and the fact that you have to do the project separately that's a cost 
I'm not going to kid you, that's a modest cost. So most folks, most districts, when they're doing one, they do the other. It, it ties the whole thing in. We are putting a, a trench drain on the inside of the track. And so when we're done, if we were to say preserve the track and keep it pristine, there's some doing there. So, you know, now would be the time as opposed to a year or two from now. The black is showing through, and so it's time to do that coating before you get into that E layer and suffer any damage. Thanks. <clears throat> Dr. Levinson? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so several questions were, were raised already that uh, I'm glad were raised, and um, uh, were ones that I had going into this, but there's one one area where I'm just looking at, for instance, the, the throwing sports for track were moved to the softball field. I, I'm just curious if there were any concerns raised about the location of those in terms of safety and space and whatnot. I mean, obviously, the people are throwing objects. Objects. <laughs> and then I'd be concerned about, you know, pre preserving the, 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 the safety of the... I, I haven't heard anything from the discussions that we've had. Obviously, we can't throw a javelin on a new um, turf field. And so the thought process was, in it, rather than moving one venue, like the javelin up there, to move all three throwing venues so that the supervision would be there for all three events. As far as throwing anything into what's out there, uh, it's my understanding that, that field is very rarely used for practice and, and it's used usually for activities. The memorial field is, is fenced off. We've laid out the longest throws that are in PIA AA records, so I don't think that we're going to have a javelin that overshoots it. So I think we've laid it out with, with uh, a lot of mindfulness. All right. Uh, that, was just, that was my okay. concern. Thank you. Uh, round two, Mr. Ballard. Yes, yeah, so the first thing I wanted to ask was um, all of these turf uh, companies are on a state contract, is that not correct? They are. So these are all uh, essentially laid out uh, in a pre-bid fashion for the costs and so forth with the state. Uh, the, the turf is available on state contract and the ability to do all of the work that's here is also available on state contract to be able to perform. Now that being said, that does not necessarily mean that you get the best price in our experience. Um, and people go in different directions on this. If I was replacing the turf, for instance, at Memorial Field, I might as well use that example. That's not a bad application of the state contract because I can get a price very quickly. It's already been bid negotiated on the state contract and the work is uh, simply to replace the turf in kind. Here, I have excavation, stormwater, electric work, piping work, things that are not on the state contract. And what happens is when you go and get the state contract for a turf project like this, they're required to give you three quotes. And the turf is in there. It's nailed in there. The price is locked down. It's $4.33 a square foot or square yard to install. The rest of the work is not on state contract. And so you're getting whatever the price is that's available. Our, our proposal is rather than go on state contract to one manufacturer of turf, bid three manufacturers of turf, allow them to compete, and allow the earthwork contractor who does all of the other work to also compete in a competitive environment. The one caveat to that is our documents have to be good documents, and it happens to be something that Dewey takes great pride in. We've had very good success in bidding the project as opposed to going state contract. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, verify that the materials cost at least was fixed pretty much on a state contract. In, in many, it is fixed on state contract, and in many cases we find that when we bid it competitively and we bid multiple manufacturers, that's the key, that the number ends up coming in just for the turf below what the state contract number is. Okay, uh, in regard uh, to Mr. Smith's comment about the commercialization, I have to point out that the whole process that we talked about with the initial approval of the agreement with Lehigh Valley Hospital Network was commercialization. 
they're paying for the field for the most part they're paying for the scoreboard and by their contract they're entitled to get a certain amount of commercialization for making some fairly large payments to the school district so it's really difficult to uh, look at it and say well we can be purists about this thing because we've already sacrificed a, b a bit of purity for money is what it amounts to uh, you know in the grand scheme of things if we wanted this bad enough we could pay for it ourselves and we were looking for ways to save money to keep our budgets down and the taxpayer impact down and we found lehigh valley hospital network willing to uh, put money into this project so i can't look at a couple of little symbols on the purity of the field as being a big deal uh, for 1.2 million dollars for the the turf uh, and a couple of signs in the d zone i can't i can't get worried too much about uh commercialization because I doubt that people will actually notice much of those anyway so uh, they'll be watching the people on the field so there there's that and and the other thing is is that any project at this stage is always an estimate we could get bids below the estimate and we get bids above the estimate and then we got to decide we, this is not a decision point mm -hmm. this is just the initial you know showing all of the complications of this project and what we have to go through to get this done and so uh, we're not making a decision tonight about you know we're committed to spend x number of dollars extra out of the um, capital reserve fund or anywhere else because until we sign a contract with somebody that says we're going to pay them to put this field in this is just talk we're still trying to gather all the information trying to find out what thing we're in i'm personally amazed that it came in this close knowing what the construction business has been like over the past year and what's happened to other projects there are many projects in the valley for for schools actually that have been come up and canceled because the bids are coming up so high because of the, the low uh, availability of labor and the and the amount of building going on in the valley that is sucking up all of the resources to do these things so right now uh, i'm i'm not tr tremendously bothered by the fact that maybe a uh, hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars might have to be extra if we want everything that's in here until we see the bids we have no real way of estimating or not estimating knowing what the cost is going to be and we will have some things that we can give up in order to keep the cost down so I'm not tr tremendously worried about th this at this stage we're not committing to a whole lot of stuff we're just finishing out the engineering contract and putting things eventually out for bids and at that point we have the decision do, do you spend the money or not and when it, when somebody's talking about our our contribution might be five to ten percent at most of a project for a, a one and a half million dollars i can't see that as being a uh, a great hindrance to moving forward at this point okay thank you thank you mr champagne yeah just i know that dewey's not responsible for the scoreboard per se but contractually we have to have that in by a year from now with lehigh valley hospital yeah. network so when do we have to do we have to bid all that and when do we have to get that moving forward so that we can contractually meet our obligation to lehigh valley health network so the state contract quote is available and you can act on it from tonight forward so that's a that's a valid quote uh, i think it was obtained late winter or so so it should be updated and brought back maybe a decision as to whether or not the led banner would be there and you'd be locked in and that quote includes installation the structural steel and the scoreboard what you're relying on us to do and it would require a, a, an additional fee would be to design the foundation for that scoreboard so i could put a proposal together for that but you could pull that you could still pull that trigger as far as buying the scoreboard at the end of the year and still be able to put it in 
Okay, so we have enough time to make that commitment to Lee Valley Health. No. Yes. Good. When bids come in, if you say go on the scoreboard, the scoreboard would be here. It's probably the last thing to go up. It typically is on all the projects. The track wants to be done. You bring it in, you set it in place. You have the foundations that go in before you do the track coding, and it goes up. Well, we have to have it in by 2020. Mm -hmm. The field doesn't have to be in until 2022, according to the contract. So we have, there's, it's kind of a two-year gap. They, Lehigh Valley wanted that scoreboard in before the field went. Right. Okay. So decided to make them happen at the same time. Okay. All right. I, you do them at you, the same time. Yeah. You filled in the gap for me because I was under the impression that the field was also required by the end of next no, year as well. The field okay. is not done until 2022. It's a scoreboard that has to be done by August 31st of 2020. So that's why I was just asking the question. Are we well, it does make sense to do them both at the same time, yeah, not, not the scoreboard first and the field second, or the field and the track second. Okay. Mr. Smith? I just follow up and clarify my, to my previous comment that I made. Um, yes, I recognize that uh, LVHN has made a uh, large investment in our field. They are making an investment in grabbing people's attention and their eyes and getting their brand out. I don't, I don't want to preclude them from putting on the D's or putting it somewhere on the scoreboard or anything like that. My concern was strictly inside the field of play. That was where my concern was. And yes, I do have a, from a purity standpoint, I do have a problem with that. And if we, if we think about what we care about, we don't care about eyes, we care about what we are offering our students. And so when I think about it from that standpoint, to me, if we go back to Les Mis, right? Different opportunity we, we offer our, our students. If in that wonderful barricade, we had a little, little logo that said presented by the Home Depot, we would look at that in the audience and we would say, well, it's not really that intrusive. But if they're, you know, helping pay for a new stage or something, we got to let them have that. You wouldn't do that. That would seem strange. It would seem out of place because it's not what we are it, from a, from a what we do for kids. It doesn't fit. And so that was my my point that the field of play doesn't fit. A company logo when we can put the company's logo who's making this investment somewhere else and still get those same sets of eyes to be able to see that and still meet the goals of the investor for the project that was that was the point that i was trying to make thank you any other comments thank you oh, uh, Ms. Um, Ms. i'm I just wanted, since I started, I thought I might just follow up now that I've listened to everybody talk. Um, I'm very comfortable with moving forward with the design phase, um, but also very interested in finding ways to shave off some costs so that we don't come much above what was invested in this. Um, as a board member, my main reason that I voted for this was um, to improve safety on the field. So things like a uh, fancy scoreboard um, really are not a priority for me, but I know that that comes along with the project because that came along with the investment from the hospital but that said I don't necessarily feel comfortable at some point in the future um, putting more money into a scoreboard than we need so I, I just thought um, I would state that now so that it's not a surprise somewhere down the road when it comes up okay right. thank you any other comments questions thank you thanks very much we do need to give them some feedback I didn't hear anyone suggesting we stop. Is there anyone suggesting just to put a hold on this? So yes, I'm saying go ahead. Okay, I'm under very strict instructions. Anything that comes up, I report to the admin team. They'll get to you. They'll keep you informed, uh, as will I, as we go through the process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to. Uh, uh, refunding the bond issue. Do we have another presentation? We do. Um, also, as a follow-up, at our, our last meeting on June 24th, 
we had representatives from PFM and RBC Capital Markets who came and spoke to the board about a bond refinancing opportunity. And so joining us now this evening as a follow-up to that, um, we have Scott Shearer from PFM and Jens Daumgard joining us again to talk more about that opportunity and, and what it might offer. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Everyone should have a handout with a yellow cover on. A lot of this is going to look very familiar. <clears throat> Does everyone have a copy? Yeah. I should have put one on everyone's. Yeah. I thought I may have one extra. Everybody good? Okay. So this looks very similar to when my colleague Ben was here uh, a few weeks back, as mentioned. But why don't we just kind of walk through this, answer any questions that you may have or you thought of since the, since the last meeting, and then I'll turn it over to your bond council to briefly review the resolution before you as well. So from a timeline perspective, again, kind of stepping back big picture, what we're contemplating here is a resolution that looks to refinance two of the outstanding bond issues of the school district. It would be to refinance the Series A of 2012 bonds as well as the Series of 2014 bonds. So from a timeline perspective, um, on page two here, and it lays out what we already discussed on your June 24th meeting. Um, that was kind of the authorization to, to proceed this evening. We we have a board meeting to consider approving the maximum parameters resolution that again we'll review briefly and then the rest of the month here in July would be if, if approved tonight uh, a lot of uh, work with the team to create the offering document go through the credit rating um, work as well with your with your administration various due diligence calls uh, and then we'd actually look to price the bonds that's when we'd actually lock in the interest rates lock in the saving either late July or or early August. So there's a, a lot of work to be done between now and, and the end of the month, early next month, if you do decide to proceed this evening. And then we will close about a month later in, in September. Um, on page, uh, the next page, um, again, the market has overall stayed about the same from when, uh, when the other part of the team was here uh, last month. So nothing new to really report there. Uh, page three, the the columns highlighted in yellow, columns three and four, those are the two different transactions that we're looking to refinance. So again, basically taking those two bond issues, refinancing them into one bond issue, we would not be changing the amortization or the weighted average life, basically just going from a higher rate to a lower rate, keeping the same amortization, and that's what we'll be producing the net savings here that we'll get to, get to shortly. Um, and then the, a lot of the rest of this is, is more detail. Page four is the actual um, amortization schedule for the 2012A bonds. Uh, in column two, you see in their entirety right now, there's about 6.7 million outstanding with their respective interest rates. Uh, now, if you look in column three, that's the interest rates on those current bonds. So if you did nothing, um, you know, just kept those bonds outstanding, that would be the interest rate that the school district would continue to, to pay, which are actually very low rates. Um, on page four on column three kind of ranging in, in the low two percent um, and then on, on the next page that's the 2014 bonds on page five again in column three those are very low interest rates as well so that's where we've been watching this uh, potential transaction now for quite some time well over a year maybe going on two years and it was just not producing the worthwhile savings to come before the board until just, just recently so you know again how long this market holds out we don't really know uh, we just kind it came into the money very quickly it could come out very quickly as well we just you know that's why we wanted to be proactive get the opportunity in front of you as soon as possible for your consideration of that resolution so because those rates are so low on the existing bond this is one where you know in the past we've hit some pretty good home runs over the years by realizing a lot of savings net savings on some of the transactions this is not one of those this is one where you know we'll be kind of hitting a single maybe on this it's um, it's, it's still savings um, um, we are past the call dates on those two respective bond issues. So basically now going forward, even if rates stay the same, um, you're going to basically start, the, the savings are going to start diminishing because we have less time on our side. So we, um, you know, unfortunately the rates weren't um, 
as low when we hit the most opportune time to refund these but now that we're past the call date you know again we still have the ability to refinance but again basically waiting for rates to go much lower is, is kind of counterintuitive just because we have less time on our side here so on page seven this would be again these numbers are very similar to to when other folks were here a few weeks ago we're showing net savings of about hundred and sixty thousand dollars most of that realized in the in the up, upcoming fiscal year the 1920 year uh, and and some little a uh, little bit of savings thereafter so I think one of the items that your bond council is going to point out in the resolution is the the net savings target um, that's something we've discussed over the years on, on all your different refinancing transactions because of the uh, the length of this transaction being relatively short uh, a little less than, than 10 years uh, and given where we are um, as far as the call date being past the call date of the bonds that we're refinancing we'd be I think putting on the table a recommendation closer to say 1% savings I know in the past um, you know over the past 20 years or so since I've been working with the school board we've looked at 2% or say 200,000 of, of net savings as a floor um, typically those were for much longer transactions say 20 year uh, transactions where the, you know a lot of life left on those um, a lot of times those were advanced refunding where we were actually Actually entertaining the refinancing prior to the call date of the old bonds which legally now we're not even actually able to do that law changed a few years back so this one has different circumstances than a lot of the transactions that we've discussed in the past so I think that's where we'd be comfortable recommending you know around, <coughs> excuse me around that one percent which is about one hundred twenty five thousand dollars or so and again, that is net savings. So that's net of the state share of the savings, that's net of the issuance costs, which are broken out on, uh, on the following page, on page eight. <clears throat> and then lastly, on, uh, on page 10, and again, your bond council will get into this briefly. You know, we're looking at a transaction close to about, you know, a little less than $13 million to refinance both of the 12 A's and the 14's. But again, what we've done in the past here at, at East Penn is do a parameters resolution and where we have maximum amounts, maximum dollar amounts, maximum interest rates. So you see on that schedule on page 10, we're looking at maximum parameters amount of 16.25 million with that maximum rate of five and a half percent. Well, obviously at those amounts and those interest rates, we're not gonna hit those savings thresholds. Again, your bond council can speak more to why we do this to give the school district, to give the financing team the most flexibility to price the bonds at the most opportune time as opposed to waiting for one of your regular scheduled uh, scheduled board meeting and so typically th these uh, maximum amounts are say inflated by about 20 percent of the size of the issue so here you know we're looking at around 12 million dollars 13 million dollars that's why you see a couple million dollars added to that conservative you know to add to that conservativeness of the numbers so basically if you would approve this resolution this evening um, when we actually go to price the bond say early August after the transaction is completed and we do uh, the actual financing closer to the number shown here on page seven the 12 and a half million or so then your bond council is going to file some additional work additional paperwork with the state to basically say East Penn authorized up to 16 million and change but we only issued 12 million and change so eliminate that difference from our our debt statement um, going forward and again that's he, Mr. Dumbler can speak more to that as well but it's very normal to do um, to do that procedure so I think with that I will stop and answer any questions you may have regarding the numbers before we turn it over to your bond capsule any questions mr ballard yeah could you state what the uh, maximum parameters uh that's going to be in the in the motion uh, uh result in terms of the intended savings to the district i mean is it as low as 125,000 and the high is 160,000 or what are we looking at the low would be basically 125,000 you know again roughly one percent um <laughs> of what we're refunding the highs would be whatever the market bears so i don't foresee this going much above the 160,000 that we have here just because of this one's not a very rate sensitive transaction meaning that even if rates go down much lower it's not really going to 
produce much additional savings. So the upside, there's, there's no cap on the upside legally, but from a practical standpoint, I don't see the savings going much above 160,000. But the floor would be that what's in the resolution, that 1% that net savings. Okay, and, and is there an additional risk with the parameters that we've got that, uh, at the 5.5% or are we looking at the, the, the entire uh, transaction would be canceled if it doesn't meet the parameters? Yeah, the, 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 basically the one number that, that we care about a, a lot in, that, in, the, in the resolution, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there, a lot of legal ease, but we really care about that savings threshold. So we cannot proceed to actually price the transaction unless we hit that minimum savings target. So yeah, if we get the 5.5% rates, that's not going to generate 1% savings, so we, we just have to put it on hold. Okay, so because right now that resolution is blank as far as we're concerned. So I mean, we there was a blank for that. For the savings threshold, yep. That, that that's right. So I think when you make the motion, you don't want to fill uh, fill that number. And again, what we're putting on the table for consideration is the one percent. Okay. Are there any questions, Mr. Jankowski? So, so the upside of doing this is we, we could realize up to one hundred sixty thousand in savings. Oh, is there a downside of going ahead with this transaction? Um, no, really no downside. I mean, again, as long as we're, well, we can't proceed if we're below that minimum threshold, so we really see no downside. I mean, it's kind of a house cleaning item where, um, well, we're actually not even reflecting any savings. By going from two transactions to one transaction, you're saving an additional, you know, maybe $700 a year as well with annual paying agent fees. We don't even reflect that in here, but there are some other, you know, um, incidental savings, but no, there's really no, really no downside. The downside would be if in two months something terrible happens in interest rates. From a market uh, timing perspective, yeah, I mean, there's always the that only, chance that the market the drops. Timing is the only downside. Yeah. Well, you're spending you're spending about twenty five to thirty thousand dollars because you got to do the, the bond rating. You got to do something. Oh, if it doesn't happen, if so we put the kind of, if we put the right. threshold too high and we do all the work and don't do a transaction it. there's some yeah. transaction costs regardless of whether we go forward or not but yeah. they explained last time because it's the, the uh, you got to go to the credit agency to get that rating and if you that doesn't timing doesn't work out and the interest rates spike you know and so, go forward right we're out to twenty thousand yeah. dollars to moody's plus whatever other nickels and dimes are but yeah, so i guess i was looking at it forward with it if we do go forward with it we hit we hit that threshold number what what I mean are we losing out on anything in the future or I mean is there any is there any reason reason not to try right. what, what are there any right is there anything that we're giving up by doing this now so, so I'll, that's, that's a good point I, I was answering the question maybe a little bit differently so as far as the, I see no downside in approving the, the resolution um, because this is a current period of funding, meaning again, we're either at or past the call date, there's a lot of other analyses that are sort of off the table now that I've actually, we, we've discussed this here in public meetings over the past with uh, refunding efficiency percentages with option call analyses. You know, do we do we refinance two years before the call date, or do we wait till the call date? Right. That's not even applicable in this transaction because this is a current period refunding. So from that standpoint, there's there, again, there's no downside. It, this does not pertain. It does not pertain. Those analyses do not pertain to this transaction. As far as you know, approving the resolution and then the market going away from us, meaning rates going up and we're not able to hit the minimum threshold. You know, the, the um, there's a, a sunk cost to advertise for, for the resolution for this evening meeting, and that may be, what, $1,000, maybe, maybe somewhere in that ballpark that was the cost of putting the advertisement in the paper for this evening. So that's already kind of, a, again, a sunk cost. From a rating agency perspective, what we would do is we'd send the information, if you approve this this evening, we'll send all the information to the rating agency tomorrow, but we'll hold off on having the call till it's kind of late as prudently possible so that they don't start incurring they basically don't start incurring their fees the rating agency until we have that phone call with your business office and us to go through that so then we try to keep that window very small from when we have that phone call to then when we actually price the bonds to try to eliminate that risk and that could be you know maybe if, if, if we have that call and the market goes away from us meaning rates go higher that could maybe be some cost of an additional 
for the size transaction, maybe eight thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, somewhere around there. But we we've done a pretty good job in the past with again, we can't predict the market, but with trying to keep that window as tight as possible to to mitigate that risk as much as possible. We can never eliminate it, but at least we're, we'll be able to mitigate it quite a bit. Maybe you can lock down Twitter. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> Ms. Bowman? Um, um, just a point of clarification. Um, you said this, but it just went by a little too fast. I just want to make sure I understand it correctly. The um, possible savings of 120 to 160 or whatever ends up being, that is a net number with the transaction costs removed, or are there transactions? Jack can't talk. The costs that we need, is it? It's already netted out. Okay. So again, we, we net out the state is going to, uh, they're going to take advantage of about seven cents on the dollar so the state's going to have a few thousand dollars of savings as well which is already netted out of here and the issuance costs are already netted out so the hundred what we're showing on on page seven hundred sixty thousand that is the true net savings that the district would, would realize yep thank you you're welcome mr bird is that underwriter's discount is that locked in or is that variable that is not locked in until we until the day of pricing well, how variable is it going to be? Oh, you don't know at this point. Yeah, it's, it's going to stay probably in that in that same region, but we don't like to lock it down until we actually get to the to the day of, of pricing. So that could affect uh, the total amount of savings. based on where that lands at. That's right. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Any other questions? Um, I guess we'll proceed then to the. Um, you said the bond council will walk us through the resolution. Okay, thank you very much. Nice to be here. Um, yes, I'm going to be summarizing proposed resolution. I believe you have it on your computers or in hard copy. Um, it's in draft form. It was advertised that we're satisfying a law known as the Local Government Unit Debt Act, which applies to all governmental entities in Pennsylvania that have taxing power. And, and they go through a process of approval of filings and approval with the state before uh, debt can be approved and then the debt be uh, issued. So that's where we're starting tonight. And you heard this word parameters. What we're doing is we're authorizing the scope of the financing. In other words, the maximum amount of borrowing, the maximum interest rates, but it also then delegates to the administration and gives it guidance as to what the expect expectations of the board are in their dealings with the financial team in moving forward, because this is the only formal action required to be taken by the board to have the bond issue take place. So hence, that obviously savings target is the is a paramount um, test here in terms of what the the um, administration will be looking for in doing the final approvals. We also get to get a head start in this filing process and so on by approving in this manner. The old way some of you would have been part of the earlier where we'd actually have a bond sale and go all that through that the day of a board meeting, but then of course you're hoping that the interest rates are at their best the night of a board meeting. And so this gives that flexibility for them to choose when to go to market. And like everything else, Bonds, there's a supply and demand. When there's a low supply, there's high demand, that means lower interest rates, more savings. So they wanna go to market on a day when there's a lot of other bonds in the market. So the mechanics for the bond issue, I'm not gonna go dwell on it, a lot of what's in here is the mechanics. But the new bond issue will work like the bonds that you're refunding. And it's the traditional form of bond issue by districts. They're called general obligation bonds, backed by the full faith, credit, and taxing power of the district, a covenant to budget appropriate and pay them as they're due. There's no mortgage or that type of collateral. It's a pure promise to pay, and it's your good, your financials, your good track record, your good stewardship that then translates to the bond rating and that's what the bond uh, buyers are going to be looking at. So, um, again, 
there's no real difference in how the bonds are going to act. Otherwise, they're going to have the low interest rate. These bonds, I think it's fair to say that this would probably be the one and only refinancing of these particular bond issues. More than likely. Maybe yeah. we'll have a call feature on them. Yeah. Let's yeah. see. These new bonds will then probably have a, presumably maybe a five-year, five or seven, five or seven-year call. So there's not going to be much bonds left by that time. So we're utilizing that opportunity here on these on these bond issues. Uh, take that. So that's what you're really doing here, making a decision. Hey, and you're grabbing a, a bond market that's given to you, and we didn't expect that to happen. So it seems to make good sense to do so. So um, it requires a, a vote of majority, five yes votes required to be passed, and a resolution. And um, I'm happy to answer any other questions regarding it. Are there any other questions for the bond council? So the motion could say to adopt the resolution as presented, inserting, you could say 1% or 125,000, however you decide is more comfortable, um, inserted in the resolution. And I'll see to it that it's inserted for your minute book record. Okay. I'd like to see a, a, a dollar figure rather than a percentage. Uh, Mr. Ballard? Yes, I move to... Uh fill in the resolution number at $135,000. Do we have a second? Uh, there are no seconds? I'll second it for the point. Sorry. Okay. Is there any discussion? I would mm -hmm. prefer the $125,000 threshold versus the $135,000 as mentioned earlier. Do we want to discuss it? I, uh, well, I'd be, I'm just curious why you're saying 135 versus 125. Well, I, f I believe that 1% uh, is a little bit low on the uh, bottom end of the percentage when we're at about 55 for the other end. And I believe that uh, also we're risking eight or nine, ten thousand dollars against uh, you know some number, and uh, 135,000 is much more money for the district covering that amount that we've risked okay a little larger chance that we won't won't go through with the deal is the, the issue are there any other comments excuse me if there's a question what would happen if yeah. if it did come in low we could we could amend the resolution to lower it if it looks like we're not going to hit that number but that would require another the two advertising number. and then another board meeting yeah i mean I, I guess i'm of the opinion i'd like to give us i understand mr ballot's point about we are risking some capital if the transaction doesn't go forward but i guess you know we potentially have seen another five thousand dollars of savings in the last two three weeks um i think it would you know one hundred twenty five thousand dollar threshold gives the the district plus the the team a little more flexibility to to try to work the transaction so i'm that's why i'm advocating the the, the 125. I'd, I'd be in line with that too. Do you want to make a uh, amendment, or are you open to a friendly amendment on this? I'd prefer an amendment. Do you want to offer an amendment? Uh, I'd like to offer an amended motion to, you know, set the target savings at one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. There a second for that. Second. We have a second. Any further discussion? So we're now voting on the, the motion as amended to fill in the blank with 125,000. Um, Ms. Allen, Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Ballard. No. Ms. Allen. Aye. Mr. Bird. Aye. Mr. Champagne. Aye. Mr. Jankowski. Aye. Dr. Levinson. Aye. Mr. Smith. Aye. Dr. Bacher. Aye. Seven ayes, one nay. Motion passes. Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Next on the agenda is the district update with Mrs. Campbell.
we have a few summer updates. Um, the first is I'd like to congratulate and recognize Dr. Tom Mirabella, who's with us this evening. He is our Director of Student Services. And he was recently appointed to become a member of the Mental Health Planning Council, which is a state level committee that's supported by the PA Department of Human Services. And so as part of his work on that committee, Dr. Mirabella will help to ensure um, our Commonwealth's public mental health and substance abuse system to be sure that that system continues to focus on facilitating recovery, building resilience, as well as overall wellness of the individual served. And so um, certainly he'll be a great representative of needs that districts are facing um, and be able to articulate those needs at the state level and we're also hopeful that he'll be able to influence some of the supports that perhaps school districts then receive um, from the Commonwealth with regard to mental health services. So um, again congratulations and we're very proud of, of Tom and his work. Some other um, summer news, our summer lunch program which is facilitated by several Emmaus area service organizations is being offered to elementary students at Lincoln and Jefferson. Twice weekly, we have volunteers from the Emmaus Rotary, the Kiwanis, the Lioness, and the Lions Club who greet elementary students with a bag lunch as well as some um, reading materials. And the program, again, is held at Lincoln Elementary on Tuesdays and Fridays from 11.30 to 12.30, and it's happening all summer through the week of August 16th. And finally, believe it or not, East Penn students were entering the fourth week of summer break. And I know that this is often the time per potentially when students might begin to say they're becoming bored and they don't know what to do. Um, and so we just wanted to put a reminder out there to our East Penn families that the Emmaus Public Library, the Laura McCungie Township Library, both have fantastic summer programs and activities for both our elementary as well as our secondary students. And the other piece that I would remind our um, middle and high school students about is that our school libraries also have summer hours so either check out our websites or contact your schools to see when you might be able to take advantage of um, our, our school library collections. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mrs. Campbell? Ms. Bowman. Uh, well, I just wanted to um, congratulate uh, Dr. Marabella and um, also just comment on the um, summer lunch program, which I think is a wonderful thing. I occasionally see um, people sharing that East Penn should do this, and so it's nice to learn that we actually already are. Um, and I, I guess I, I would be curious at some point to know if there's a greater need than what we're already filling. Um, you know, two lunches a week, does it need to be five or um, it's just information that I would love to, to know, um, but all good. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Thank you, Mrs. Campbell. Uh, moving on to personnel, um, I have a motion for uh, item A uh, with the addendum as item B, and also with one correction. Um, in the uh, personnel exhibit uh, schedule B, uh, I note that Andy Moxie appears twice for head b basketball coach and just strike one of them, please. Okay. So moved. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Eight ayes. Motion passes. Um, we have a motion for uh, business operations, um, A, B, uh, everything but the contracts. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Allen, will you please call the roll? Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Eight ayes. Motion passes. Um, on contracts, um, I have a motion for the KFA and Bayeta nursing contract. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Levinson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Eight ayes. And finally, uh, for the transportation contract, may I have a motion? So moved. 
second. Any discussion? I, I had a question. Who's, that, who's doing the driving in that particular instance? Parents. Parents, okay. Ms. Allen, will you uh, please call the roll? Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Mr. Smith? I abstain. I have a personal relationship with the members in the confidential contract. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Seven ayes, one abstain. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to curriculum, may I have a motion for approval of the education conferences? So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? Mrs. Allen, will you please call the roll? Mr. Champagne? Aye. I said Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Aye. D, use of district Death. facility. Okay. Excuse me one second. I'm sorry, did I miss it? I, I said everything but the contracts right, in the first thing. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, doc, um, Dr. Levinson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Eight ayes. Motion passes. Uh, next we have uh, third reading uh, and adoption of our policies. Um, let's just go there. Uh, does the administration have any updates other than what's in the... We do. We have two specific um, items okay. that we'd like to discuss. All right. So I, we did just uh, receive um, two questions about the draft final version. So thanks in, uh, for sending the questions prior to the meeting. We do appreciate that. It, it is very helpful. So the first question is about policy 220. Um, since this policy was reworded, there's a question if the policy applies to students who use personal devices that are not issued by the by the school district. And the answer, it, it does provide, um, if you look in on page 204 under authority, it does explain that yes, this does apply. So if someone would do something that you know a security issue on any device whatsoever um, under authority on page 204 if you look in the middle of the second paragraph it starts to say and provided the off-campus or after hours expression does or is likely to materially or substantially interfere with the education process including school activities and it goes on there um, so that is covered there so yes it would um, so just in summary, it's covered physical posting and using school equipment in general, but if it's on a personal device, it has to materially or believed to be a materially uh, impacting the school function or safety. Absolutely. Okay. And then the second question is uh, for policy 702.1. Um, and this was discussed at, at length um, after, after the meeting. So just to kind of review the discussion that happened here at the board meeting, um, and then I can kind of provide feedback. So if you turn to page three of five at the top of the page in the last paragraph under the guideline section, there's discussion about removing that paragraph um, because it may be contradictory to another part of the policy. So what we did after discussion, um, the administrative team discussed this at length, and we also reached out to PSBA to discuss this, that if they felt it was contradictory. And um, uh, our recommendation is that it's, it is not. Um, we added one line that you can see that's bold and italicized to try to connect the two. But essentially, that paragraph reads, such resources to another classroom program and our individual as necessary. So in other words, it's saying the district reserves the right to transfer such funds. If you move on to page four of five, um, the f under use of crowd uh, crowdfunding, the first paragraph where crowdfunding resources are in the form of funds, such f funds should be sent to the district's business manager, who shall ensure that the appropriate accounting and holding of such funds until they are used for their stated purposes or stated purpose. Um, so the point here is that 
this general guideline, this policy, then sends the, the crowdfunding, if approved, on the front end, you'd want a specific amount or close to that amount, then that would be used for the stated purpose. When you go back to page three of five, if there are resources out of that campaign that the district would like the flexibility to be able to move them from classroom to classroom, or if there's you know some extra funds, um, a few dollars here or there, the, the district would like the opportunity to be able to move that as clearly or as close to the stated purpose as possible. But uh, that, of course, gives the, the district the ability to move resources to a different classroom or specific funds to that may be uh, slightly more than what was anticipated to something similar to the stated purpose. So the recommendation um, would be to keep it as is and we added that line to try and connect the two. That was the purpose of the addition of that line. Mm -hmm. So you're saying you wouldn't repurpose or, or change the original our recommendation at this point is to keep everything as is in the final version. Mr. My only admonition would be that, you know, we're clear then when we are doing the, the campaign that we state something to that effect because my concern is that someone is donating funds for a stated purpose. Mm -hmm. So the expectation is that those funds will be used for that purpose and not, a, not something else. So just so that we're clear that funds may be, so we have some qualifying say, language that you're funds saying could be excess used funds may be used for related or something. Purposes. I mean, if it's similar to the state purpose or something within those parameters, just so that we're covering our own our own bases. I think the I mean a really simple example that we talked about quite a bit. Um, again, when we're looking at page three of five, where it talks about um, the statement, the district reserves the right to transfer such resources to another classroom program or individual. Um, if through crowdfunding, let's say a primary teacher um, raises funds that are used for some specific instructional resources for that primary classroom, and then that teacher transfers to um, a sixth grade position, and those resources are no longer appropriate. It's about the district having the ability to reallocate those resources resources potentially to another primary classroom but certainly appreciate the um, the essence behind the fact that the funds are to be used for the stated purpose um, that has been communicated to the public yeah I mean I, I agree that I think it makes sense to be able to utilize those funds for a, another valid purpose it's just so that we're clear that that may be the funds may be used in that manner so that the people who are donating are aware of that so when, when they're contributing transparent with our communication yeah. yeah and that's something we can absolutely look at the process then once the policy is approved yeah are there any other questions or comments then I have a motion to approve the uh, policies. So moved. Second. Second. Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Bird. Aye. Mr. Champagne. Aye. Mr. Jankowski. Aye. Dr. Levinson. Aye. Mr. Smith. Aye. Mr. Ballard. Aye. Ms. Bowman. Aye. Dr. Bacher. Aye. Eight ayes. Motion passes. Moving on to uh, uh, LCTI, uh, Mr. Yes. Champagne, do you have yeah, a report? I do. Um, we have some photos of the welding lab. If they come up while I'm talking, that's great. Um, anyway, regarding the welding lab, um, all the engineering is 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 complete, is my understanding. Equipment, essentially, all the equipment has been delivered to the to the site. Uh, equipment has been weather protected as necessary. You can see that the, where last time we just had structural steel, they've now got structural steel plus a lot of the concrete walls, and uh, they're making good progress. They did suffer a weather delay, however, uh, when we had the torrential downpours a couple of times. Uh, that's probably a two-week delay. Uh, so they're now targeting early to mid-November for the completion of the welding lab, uh, but the project is, is still on budget. 
Um, we also approved the third year of a three-year contract for communities and schools uh, at the last meeting. That contract uh, was about $20,000. Uh, there was a request made uh, by several members of the board to have a report on the progress that is being made uh, at uh, LCTI with communities and schools. So I think that will help us as we kind of look to what communities and schools is doing for the district. And so we shall see that report uh, in August, and I'll make that available uh, once uh, we get that uh, information. Uh, we also approved what was known as the JOC seat calculation procedure uh, based on a <laughs> report that was prepared by a mathematics professor at uh, Lehigh University. I will tell you that the vote was not unanimous, though. Uh, the vote uh, of the Allentown members of the district in Whitehall Copley were against that procedure because Allentown, uh, based on the, the, the uh, procedure, did lose a board seat this past year, and uh, they do have some uh, issues with you know the fact that they are you know, sending the, uh, a large number of students there but see the representation diminishing based on the calculation but the calculation for the 2019 uh, seats was done correctly so you know it is unfortunately what it is at this point and then some good news uh, uh, an, an East Penn student uh, Gabrielle Howarth who is Ken's neighbor and Dr. Pekarik's neighbor was awarded a gold medal at the FCCA National competition mm -hmm. for culinary arts in early July so I think you know you, you, if you know uh, Miss Campbell could reach out and, and to them I would, I would greatly appreciate it but uh, they are very excited that uh, Gabrielle uh, received a gold medal that's my report are there any questions for Mr. Campbell uh, moving on to legislative report uh, Mr. Ballard Thank you. I have a number of items I have to go through uh, tonight. Uh, the first one is PSBA has asked me to circulate a postcard uh, for your signature to thank Senator Brown for his role in pushing Senate Bill 700 to, to resurrect PlanCon. So there's a possibility of some state re uh, reimbursement for uh, construction projects. Uh, this bill modernizes the state approval process for reimbursement for school construction and renovation projects. It's gone to Governor Wolf. I don't know yet whether he signed it. I'll get into that in a minute. But uh, it was a big haul for the Senate and the House to uh, pass anything on PlanCon this year. And Senator Brown led the charge to get that done. And in appreciation for that, PSBA would like members of the school board to uh, help express their uh, uh, appreciation for that. So I'll pass this down the line, and if you're uh, inclined, please sign it. And when Mr. Bird gets it, if he would pass it back to uh, our board secretary to put in the mail, uh, PSBA and I would ap appreciate it. Uh, like I said, there was a lot of work gone into doing PlanCon, and uh, I wanted to, to let you know that. Um, the last minute flurry of bills for the budget and the school code have found their way to Governor Wolf. And why you've not heard any final figures for the budget is the fact that some of the school code bills affect what the budget is actually going to do. And some of those have not been yet signed by the governor. So we're not exactly sure. So the things I'm going to, uh, to give you are basically probably the numbers that are going to be there, but it's still not 100% sure. Uh, the basic education subsidy, BEF, has been increased by 160 million, a 2.6% increase. Um, the funding for the Ready to Learn block grant is set at 268 million. However, it's not yet known because of those school code bills how it will be specifically allocated to districts. Uh, boosts for special education by 58 million dollars or 4.4 percent. Um, career and technical education received a seven million dollar increase uh, from uh, 52 million to 59 million. 
Uh, funding for career and technical equipment grants received a $3 million increase from $2.5 million to $5.5 million. Uh, Trauma-informed education, uh, a, a bill is gone through that requires uh, school districts to provide trauma-informed education. And uh, there's an increase of $250,000 for a total of $750,000, which won't go far uh, amongst all the school districts who have to uh, basically have a partially funded mandate. Um, there's some stuff for uh, pre-K and pupil transportation funding. It, pupil transportation is level funded. So there was no increase in uh, in that. And funding for non-public and charter school transportation is cut by $567,000. So it's possible, depending on how much we have in public, non-public and charter school transportation that there may be a cut to the amount that we receive again this is all in these school code bills which have some of which have gone through the governor's signature and some have not uh, the EITC tax credit program was increased by 25 million that was part of the negotiations to get some of the other stuff passed they wanted a uh, 75 to 100 million has now been cut down to 25 but it's still increased and these this is tax money that goes directly to private and non-public schools that's taken out of the revenue that the state gets companies are able to take a tax credit for donating to quote scholarships to private schools and charter schools and uh, the state does not collect that money so it's not available to pay you know higher than 2.6 percent for an increase in basic education funding for example um, flexible instruction days has also uh, been passed I believe by the governor now uh, that means that uh, you can use uh, snow days you can have electronic assignments set up to allow students to take flexible instruction as it's called over the internet for those snow days therefore they don't count as uh, days that you didn't meet the requirement to have so many education days during the school year um, there was a number of career and technical education package bills which are mainly uh, in workforce development type uh, situations. Um, school code is all over the, uh, the place. The omnibus school code bill, I don't believe it's been signed yet, uh, but it contains things like a special education funding commission, another look at the expenses which are still growing and they still don't want to pay, but we'll have another look at it. Um, you can now, the school district will now have to uh, submit an electronic copy of their budget to the PA Department of Education for placement on the website. <coughs> Even though there's been a plan con bill, it extends the moratorium on pro prohibiting PDE from uh, approving new school building construction or reconstruction applications for fiscal year 2019 20. So there would be plan con funds, but only after 2019 and 20. Um, the compulsory school age has been redefined from ages 8 to 18 to be 6 to 18. So the lower end of it uh, will affect uh, kindergarten registrations and other things in the, in the lower grades. Um, there have been a, there's a school lunch shaming change. Uh, if you're familiar with that topic, provides that if a student is not eligible for participation in the school food program and owes more than $50 in a school year for meals, a school may provide alternative meals to the student until the student's unpaid balance for school meals is paid or a payment plan has been established. Such actions by schools who choose to provide an alternative meal, whatever that is, shall not be considered as a public identification or stigmatization of a student. <laughs> Um, trying to go through here. There, like I said, there's a whole bunch of uh, things. There's been a uh, school safety and security package 
that's gone to the governor. I believe it's going to be signed. Uh, it, it clarifies training requirements. It says who can be uh, armed in schools, and there's now a uh, degree of discussion as to whether or not this bill now prohibits armed teachers in school. <coughs> <clears throat> affecting, uh, the, for instance, the Tamaqua district, which has passed a uh, policy uh, allowing that. Um, it, it allows a number of things, such as a school bus going for, to or from school activities to the list of areas a school police officer can enforce order things like that in there. Um, you, you can get contractors, uh, but they have to follow certain training requirements and things like that to carry guns on your uh, school property. Um, it allows non-public schools to have SROs, uh, allows active certified sheriffs and deputy sheriffs to serve as SROs, uh, sets new training requirements. Um, the, um, there are safety and security training changes. Uh, the current list of training topics that schools must provide their employees is amended to add trauma-informed approaches and recognition of student behavior that may indicate a threat to the safety of others. The, um, there are more grants for school safety, uh, which may mean we can apply for a grant to co cover the uh, school resource officer again. Um, some minor things about the Safe to Safe program allowing uh, the judicial warrants to obtain information from the Safe to Say program. Um, there's more on confidentiality, transference, removal of health records. Um, There's a thing called the Keystone Telepresence Education Grants. It establishes the Keystone Telepresence Education Grant Program, which will give the state's 29 intermediate units access to a maximum of $300,000 in funds to purchase telepresence equipment to support homebound students facing serious medical conditions. So there's going to be money available for, for those uh, situations. And... Um, trying to see if there's anything else. I mean, there's a whole raft of other changes, and that's the reason why you haven't heard the budget figures yet. Because until the governor signs off or vetoes every one of these things, there's a, there are implications for the budget. So uh, I think I've covered uh, most of the ones that uh, are here. Uh, there's one other one that I'm, I was interested in, the fee assistance for AP and in, uh, international baccalaureate exams. Beginning in the 2019-20 school year, PDE will provide assistance with fees for advanced placement and international baccalaureate exams for, for two students and financial need. A school entity offering the exam shall not accept any rebates from the college board or international baccalaureate program for students with financial need, and the rebate shall be credited toward the exam fee. So essentially, the PDE will be controlling uh, what students receive the rebate, <coughs> but it would be um, uh, something for students in need. I personally would advocate for the for the school district considering uh, paying the fees for all students who take the fee, who take those exams, which would be I don't think a huge amount in our budget, but would then level the playing field completely and not have to worry about whether students in advanced placement can take the advanced placement exams. Uh, eventually, I would see, like to see that into the college boards also, so that a, all of our students have the ability to see that. But that's, again, a topic for school board discussions and for budget time. But uh, they're starting to understand that at the state level and starting to make it easier for students with financial need to take some of those exams to, to uh, get further ahead. And that's basically where we stand. I think the 2.6% is probably fairly good. Where the grants are going to come out, that's going to be 
still iffy uh, because some of the grants haven't been signed yet um, and some of the uh, or the bills haven't been signed yet so we'll have to wait on that but uh, so it's a very complicated thing I want you to understand that passing quote the budget isn't enough when the school code contains provisions for spending that money so if the school code spending part doesn't get passed, then the budget doesn't mean anything. It's kind of like the federal Congress. There are bills that get passed, and there are appropriations. And if the appropriations do not provide for the spending in the bills, you don't get the money. So both parts have to work together in both the federal and the state government for that money to be actually available. So you have to listen very carefully to the language when you listen to what bills have been passed so you understand whether or not there's actual money there. Thank you, Mr. Bacher. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. Are there any questions? Uh, Mr. I Smith. Uh, two, two things. Um, not necessarily a question for Mr. Ballard, but just a general question uh, related to the, um, the flexible days and the elimination of snow days. One of the questions that I, I, when I've been reading about this, one of the questions that I've had that I haven't been able to seem to find an answer anywhere is what happens to the students that have IEPs and special needs that require instruction in a classroom and modifications to instruction? What happens to those students when they are now being instructed at home and how, how in these pilot programs that were by all reports very successful and well received by everybody how uh, the question I have is how was that challenge met so if that's something that we choose to go forward forward with in the future that's one of my biggest um, questions right now that I had with that um, the the other thing um, that uh, literally just happened this afternoon before a meeting today, uh, this is more of an informational thing for everyone here, but uh, kind of tucks right into the legislative portion of, of our meeting tonight. Um, I was invited to this afternoon speak um, with two fellow colleagues in another in other neighboring districts um, to speak with Lisa Pascola, who is the uh, state senator um, for. Mayesboro um, about a bill that she has introduced, uh, uh, SB 591, uh, which has to do with transportation to uh, public, uh, sorry, um, to, to charter, parochial, and private schools. Um, and I'm going to borrow uh, from Mr. Ballard's um, sense of prudence and caution when I say this has just been introduced, so it has a very long way to go before it, 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 it really comes out of anywhere. Um, but basically, the uh, bill that, that I was able to speak with her about um, is based off of a bill in the school, uh, a part of the school code from 1949, um, which, uh, as you would well understand, was a very different atmosphere for transpor transporting students to and from schools. Um, right now in Pennsylvania, we are one of only seven states in the country that mandate transportation to schools outside of our own public schools. And um, right now we are mandated to transport students um, as far as 10 miles outside of the school district boundaries. And her uh, uh, bill, SB 591, uh, is looking to amend that to uh, five miles. So basically to cut that in half with the intention being to save districts money on transportation costs um, because when, I, I and, and don't quote me on this, but I believe the impetus for this bill was when she learned that, I believe it was Salisbury, um, transport students to 38 different schools um, and then there's uh, I've also heard of a district I think it was Westchester down uh, the south southeastern part of the state that transports students to um, I believe it was 143 different schools so and some of these school are full-size buses transporting one or two kids at a time so it's it's not um, an efficient use of uh, taxpayer dollars so she is one of uh, three Democrats who have um, co-sponsored the bills, the bill, and she is looking for a re Republican co-sponsor. Um, so we're going to be reaching out to uh, Senator Brown um, in the near future and hoping to um, help that help that along and uh, help us save a little bit of money. So. 
Okay, in regard to the flexible instruction days, I just wanted to give a little bit more information. Inter uh, it, the instructional requirements that they would cover would be in English language arts, math, science, and social studies, limiting the subjects. And interested schools would apply with the PA Department of Education, meaning they would have to have some kind of regulations set up to do that. And the application would be valid for three years when the schools would need to be reapplied. So some of the details would st are still having to be worked out on those flexible instruction days and what you would do with students with IEPs. Are there any other questions or comments on Mr. Ballard's report? The only other piece that I have, um, really, and to thank Mr. Smith for his comments, um, Senator Boscola's office also reached out to superintendents this afternoon via an email, um, really asking for to work with superintendents and have an approximate cost associated with the impact of potentially reducing that transportation from a 10 mile to a five mile radius. Um, so certainly we will work to compile that information and, and thank you for bringing it up to the board. Certainly I can share that with our board as well, just so you have a sense in terms of how many we are transporting and an approximate cost and or savings to the district. Thank you. Okay, moving on, uh, announcements. Uh, we had an executive session before the meeting today to discuss uh, real estate and personnel. Uh, the next regular uh, board meeting is uh, Monday, August 12th at 7.30 here. And I have one other announcement that I came to indirectly. A, a recent Emmaus High School graduate, Ryan Bilger, has been in a, I don't know if other people know, has been in a, uh, on Jeopardy. And I didn't see tonight, but he won on Thursday and Friday. So he had uh, two, two wins on Jeopardy. I think he... Sixty-some thousand dollars. Yeah, so he did did very well. I think that's uh, great. I think he was on the uh, academic um, trivia team or whatever okay, uh, yeah. team here. So that's uh, he says when they announced it. He's from Mukunji. So yeah. <laughs> so uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Meeting is adjourned. I'd love to propose. Last night, I'm from the country. It's. I've been. Real quick. I'm assuming. I'm assuming. Yeah. I go. Congrats. Congrats.